the Bibliothèque Sainte Geneviève, built in Paris by Henri Labrust. A bibliotheca, a library, is above all a myth. That is a collection of all knowledge, everything written, by all people of the world. Over the centuries, this myth was accompanied by utopia, making universal knowledge available to everyone. France had to wait until the 19th century for culture to be democratized. Eight years after the French Popular Revolution of 1830, the government decided to build a university library in Paris, a place for education rather than erudition. For the first time in the history of libraries, the new facility would not be an annex to a chateau or a monastery, but would be an independent building. The concept of the public library, open to everyone, had just been invented. The new library was to be endowed with the collections from Saint Genevieve Abbey that had been turned into a school after being confiscated by the revolutionaries. Half a century after the priests had been evicted, it was the turn of the books. Bookcases were emptied and thousands of works were removed by hand and carried away on stretchers. Tirelessly over several months, a hundred journeys every day. The final stretcher carried a bunch of flowers. The architect of this new public resource was Henri Labrust. He was one of the great 19th century architects. Yet he was not nearly so well known as his contemporaries Baltar and Garnier. At odds with the all-powerful Academy of Architecture, he was for a long time an architect on paper. He was 40 before he was given his first official commission. He had long been champing at the bit. At long last, he could use his architectural implements for designing the new library site. Building work took eight years. The library opened its doors to the public in 1851. The new building occupied a narrow parcel of land 85 meters long and 21 wide. It was on top of the Montagne Saint Genevieve in Paris, overlooked by the Pantheon. This is the heart of the Latin Quarter, where the capital's faculties and major scholastic establishments are concentrated as well as the cheap restaurants where students love to slum it. Provincial fathers who send their sons to study in Paris are delighted to know that there is a new safe haven that will keep their children out of the bars and low dives. The principal of the prestigious Henri IV High School congratulated himself. This new haven had to house 500 students every day until 10 o'clock at night and contained 80,000 works. In response to this demand, the architect provided a simple and previously unthought of solution. He created a first volume to stock ancient editions, onto which he placed a second volume, the reading room. And behind, he created a third volume, the staircase that does not encroach on the other two. The plan of the library was settled, rational and revolutionary. It was the first time in the history of libraries that the room kept for precious books was separated from that devoted to the readers. The reading room occupies the whole of the first floor, a long free space without any partitions. The ground floor is dedicated to the bookstore, carefully compartmented to receive tens of thousands of works. Manuscripts and precious books are kept in a dimly lighted space, for light is bad for them, and it is divided into small cells that are themselves partitioned by bookcases. While Labrust had compartmented these spaces, largely reorganized today, above in the reading room, the volumes completely open. High and light, the reading room impresses by its size. 80 meters long, 15 high and 17 wide. His plan is like a hall, 
divided into two vessels by a central colonnade. With 500 workplaces waiting for the students and the hundreds of open bookshelves along the walls, it is the idealized image of a collective study open to all. On the façade, the decision to separate the store of precious books from the reading room is clearly declared. A simple plain fascia separates the functional ground floor, pierced by narrow openings, from the first floor, enhanced and opened by large windows. Compact and spare, La Brousse building is radically distinct from its near neighbour, the Pantheon built by Soufflot an illustrious representative of the dominant architectural movement of the period, neoclassicism. Borrowing its decorative elements from antiquity, the neoclassical movement adorned a great many edifices, disguising them as Greek temples. Breaking away from this monumental and decorative tradition, La Brousse chose to par it down, and make his modest library stand up to the colossal Pantheon beside it. On its façade, nothing projects. Yet in his first scheme, the entrance in the centre of the building was indicated discreetly by a simple Doric portal. But its two little columns and their entablature were still too much for the architect. He removed them and replaced them with two carved lamp standards to indicate the opening of the library until 10 p.m. He went still further. From an element in relief, he moved to an element sunk into the wall, recessing the doorway with its three steps into the masonry. After that, nothing stood out. Nothing could be more modest and discreet than this single door in the centre of the façade. Yet it leads to a space treated like a temple, the entrance hall. Here, monumentality has asserted its rights and the columns, refused for the façade, have finally found their place inside. The reader has entered into a temple. In the mind of the architect, this is the temple of knowledge. On the floor, marble slabs set in simple and severe geometric patterns, the image of reason itself. In this metaphorical and rational world, one decorative element stands out. La Brust would have liked to set out a garden in front of his library. As there was insufficient place, he simply had it painted on the entrance walls. The entrance hall extends across the whole width of the library. It is a surprise not to find the staircase leading to the reading room. To maintain the majestuous scope of the entrance, the architect simply pushed the staircase to the rear of the building. Designed as an independent volume, it does not encroach on the entrance nor on the reading room. By dividing the space in this way, La Brousse lays out a path. The reader crosses the entrance hall, a dark cave of ignorance then penetrates the staircase where light appears before going into the brightly lighted reading room. A symbolic path leading upwards to knowledge, orchestrated by the architect. The plan of the large reading room is what is called the Basilican plan. It is inspired by the Christian basilicas, 
whose architecture saw a spectacular development over the centuries. Until the Middle Ages, the basilicas were roofed by a timber frame, but the architects wanted more height. They built higher walls and replaced the flat frames with more noble stone vaulting. The wall spread outwards under their weight and the edifice was in danger of collapse. To counter the spreading effect of the vaults, buttresses were raised. The walls were relieved. At last it was possible to have openings. At first they were narrow. Later they became larger and larger. For the Bibliothèque Saint-Geneviève, La Brousse took his inspiration from this tradition and added an important innovation. He placed the buttresses inside his building. That way he obtained a completely flat exterior facade. Nothing could now obstruct the entry of light. The walls were no longer load-bearing. La Bruste was able to put in 40 windows to bathe the reading room with light entering from all sides. Light is the first necessity for a library program. It must be diffused, come from several directions at once, satisfying both reading and surveillance, reads a treatise of the period. From the outside, the building projects an image of a sober stone fortress. But the inside conceals a quite different world. An architecture of iron. Incombustible, iron is a protection against books' worst enemy, fire. At that time, iron was essentially used for industrial and utilitarian buildings, such as railway stations, market halls and bridges. But we are in a library, an architectural programme considered to be noble. And then, although it was customary and easy enough to disguise it, the architect made the astonishing choice of revealing it. Displaying a traditional material, stone, along with an industrial material, iron, stupefied Le Bruce contemporaries. In fact, the coexistence of these two materials structures the whole building. On the ground floor, the central colonnade, the walls and the buttresses are in stone. But on the first floor, the two materials combine. The colonnade is stone and iron. The buttresses are in stone. They support the arches in a metallic frame, all enclosed by stone walls. The colonnade of the reading room is a perfect illustration of the simultaneous use of both materials on the first floor. The 18 columns comprising it are hybrid. Above a solid masonry base rise high and light fluted pillars in cast iron. Conversely, in the entrance hall, the heavy stone columns go all the way up. A surprise find on the ceiling are the fine cast iron arches linking these massive pillars. This is in fact the metallic structure that supports the first story. While any other architect would have masked it with a filled in ceiling, La Brousse leaves it exposed and invites visitors coming into the library to question themselves about the architecture of the room they are entering. On the ground floor, the columns carry iron arches that the architect had painted green to emphasize their presence. On the first floor, the central column is lengthened as if it goes right through the floor. It is curiously arrested in its elevation to join up with the cast iron pillar on which the metallic framework rests. From one floor to the next, the proportions of the materials are inverted. The constructive choices are clearly indicated. The architect brings out this unexpected union between iron and stone. 
playing on the colour contrasts, their juxtaposition and their spatial proportions. While at eye level, the stone bases of the columns are sculpted. Higher up, the cast iron capitals are not forgotten. The visible fixing bolts are accompanied by finely worked vegetal motifs, even though they are more than 14 metres above the floor. On the vault, cream coloured to enhance the iron, there are painted black lines to emphasise the curvature of the arches. Originally, the tables were arranged lengthwise in the room, and Le Brust placed bookcases between the columns. Was there a lack of space for the open bookshelves, or did he intend to hide the stone bases of these curious hybrid columns? We shall never know. Whatever the reason, the librarians complained about it. According to them, the shelving cut the room in two and surveillance in four. In 1930, this huge cage was removed to reveal the stone base of the columns. And faced with the success of the library, the tables were rearranged laterally to increase the capacity of the room. Instead of 500 places, there were now 700. Books form the only decoration of the room. They are freely accessible on the open shelves, a symbolic expression of knowledge available to all. An expression firmly attested by the architect. In the reading room, there is nowhere along the wall that is not papered with literature of all sorts. For once here, Le Bruce did not turn away from the traditional image of the museum library. Between the buttresses under the windows, he placed the first level of bookcases, then another with access by a gallery. Finally, for the books without open shelves to sit on, additional bookcases were provided. But this formal arrangement of the books had an inconvenience. The library staff who classify and arrange the open shelves are also visible. La Bruste thought that their manual work took away from the nobility of the venue and disturbed the concentration of the cherished students, so he decided to skirt around the subject subtly. Firstly, he hid the vertical flow by placing the bookcases in front of the steps, thus making little cubicles in which the books could be arranged. Secondly, he masked the horizontal flow by piercing the buttresses, thus creating an inner passage between each cubicle that he cleverly concealed behind a long wall of books. These stairs are particularly steep and dangerous, especially for anyone carrying a pile of voluminous books. Faced with revolution from the librarians, the architect finally gave way and agreed to have four staircases placed at each angle of the gallery. He always regretted it and made do with the strict minimum for transferring books from the store on the ground floor and up to the reading room. The librarians had to be satisfied with two little spiral staircases, so narrow that it was better for two colleagues not to try to cross. <laughs> La Bruste kept the majestic central staircase for the readers.
The architect insisted on designing all the decorative details of the room. The mosaics on the floor, whose patterns are repeated in paint on the window arches. The capitals of the buttresses, whose sculpting refers back to the wooden uprights of the bookcases. And also the tables, chairs, the gas lamps, long since replaced, and even the ink wells. And he took particular care over the design of the wooden chairs, very straight with extremely short backs, that tended to cut into the reader's spine after a few hours of study. He was criticised for this, but more than 150 years later, the chairs are still there, and the library is full of students all year round, men and women. Yet when it was opened, only men were admitted to the evening sessions. A few years later, as an experiment under certain conditions, the presence of foreign women readers were authorised. No untoward incidents were noted. Flirting in Polish or Russian was not in the power of just any student. The names of the most illustrious authors and savants of the history of humanity were engraved on the façade. 810 names in chronological sequence, from Moses to Berzelius, a chemist who died in 1848, the year the façade was completed. For Le Brust, these engraved names were the very image of a library catalogue, a monumental catalogue published on the façade. And the names of these authors were not posted just anywhere. Le Brust had them engraved precisely on the reverse placement of the bookshelves in the reading room. And thus obtained the subtle effect of a mirror between the contents of the library and this encyclopedism displayed on its façade. Behind, the panels are oddly left empty. Was this to spare the engraver falling off his ladder too often? Or was it because his façade is invisible from the street? Or was it just to leave a place for the great names of the centuries to come? We shall never know. At the time, the architect was much reprimanded for the composition of his façade. Some thought it naive, others overly audacious. Nowadays, the splendid modernity of this speaking architecture is recognised. Speaking, but for a detail. For between each of the windows are large iron points that give a strange emphasis to the long stone wall. It is the internal metallic structure showing on the outside. The roof arches are stabilised by tie beams anchored in the wall. But without any functional justification, these tie beams pierce the façade here. And their poking through the wall is indicated by the pointed bolt heads, like artillery shells. These bolts are fixed to striped iron roundels, as if the architect used this detail to refer to the image of a bolt that is screwed. This subtle intention is reinforced by a motif sculpted in the stone three small flowers with stems twirled by the movement of the bolt. This decorative affectation is all the more surprising because the bolts and the delicate sculpted flowers are more than 18 metres above the ground, as invisible as it is incomprehensible for the passerby. Although this detail is unseen by people below, it may be that the architect was giving his peers a message. The imitation of antiquity had had its day. Architecture must henceforward be modern and rational. The function and the constructive decisions concerning a building should be shown off. The Bibliothèque Saint-Genevieve is a great historical date in the history of architecture and libraries. For the last 150 years, it has never been empty.
the architect has won his bet. Generation upon generation of readers, from the French historian Jules Michelet to the feminist Simone de Beauvoir, have savoured the pleasure of studying together there. <laughs>